Hillsborough Stadium, 15th of April 1989. One of the darkest pages in British history still remains the deadliest stadium-related disaster in Britain and one of the worst ever international football accidents. 96 deaths and 766 injuries, all of them Liverpool fans. 23 years later, the 96 as they are called in Liverpool are not forgotten. Following a governmental e-petition which had reached over 139,000 signatories on the 17th of October 2011, Parliament has agreed to debate the full release to the public of cabinet documents relating to the disaster. But what led so many people signing the early release of the files more than 20 years later? One possible answer is our claims of injustice and defamation. Injustice, as no one has been held responsible for the disaster, and defamation, as the Sun tabloid has never really given account for its headlines that offended the entire Merseyside population and led to a mass boycott against the newspaper that is still ongoing. Initially, no one realised the full extent of a disaster that took place in Hillsborough that day. At that end of the ground where the Liverpool supporters are, the game has been stopped, nothing is happening, the players are moving towards the centre circle and the police are trying to get control of this situation once more. They're now getting spectators off the field, but this really doesn't bode well at all. But it's quite clear to me that the Liverpool end there, either people have got in with forged tickets or perhaps there are too many tickets have been printed, perhaps there's been a problem with the gates or the turnstiles at that end, but there are too many people in the Liverpool end of the ground, and that's the top and bottom of it. And I, I can only say this by observing what I've seen. I think, although I hope we haven't, but I think we have had at least one fatality here, and we have a very, very serious situation, and there are still people going away on stretchers. A very serious situation. Another boy is being carried by his mates now just in front of us not very uh, medically approved i shouldn't think yet misinformation about the causes had already begun as controversial allegations were disseminated in the media blaming the fans alcohol and other factors that could be held responsible for the accident especially since a few years earlier the tragedy at the hazel stadium in belgium had established a notorious fame for liverpool fans the police control room say that there has been no gate charged in by the Liverpool supporters. There are simply too many people in that end of the ground and the crush has caused this enormous chaos. So there is bound to be a Football Association inquiry into this and the first thing they're going to have to look at is whether too many tickets have been given to the Liverpool supporters or whether in fact they've uh, overestimated the capacity at that end of the ground. So clearly lots to talk about, but no problem as far as Liverpool supporters charging a gate in. There has been no trouble from that point of view at all, and the Liverpool supporters simply came onto the field because they were forced there, because people were actually being severely hurt in that end of the ground. They had to stop the game in order for people to get out and for the ambulance people to get in. Now, I've got to repeat, because I understand that BBC television are giving a different story, that I have been to the police room, I have checked with the police, and the police say that this problem has been caused by sheer weight of numbers, no gates have been kicked in, no supporters have got in with illegal tickets. This is purely because there are just too many people at one end of this Sheffield Wednesday ground, and if you're listening to anything else from BBC television, then they haven't spoken to the police about it. But the worst was yet to come. Headlined The Truth and run on the 19th of April 1989, four days after the disaster, the Sun's story alleged that the disaster followed mass drunkenness among Liverpool supporters 
and that some of the fans had urinated on police and on victims and picked victims' pockets as their bodies lay on the pitch, but had also beaten up pieces trying to come to aid for those in need. The Sun initially said the allegations had come from unnamed South Yorkshire police officers and from a Tory MP. Not surprisingly, these allegations and the way they were presented caused a massive public outcry. Was it the Monday or the Tuesday? I can't remember after that Saturday that the, the Sun newspaper came out and you know, I mean like everybody else, I mean just felt absolutely outraged by it. But it was you know, it was just so clear what was going on in terms of, you know, this kind of conspiracy that was going on to blame the Liverpool fans. The truth in their eyes was that um, Liverpool fans were, were drunk at the game, that they kicked down a gate. Um, there were some horrendous things in, the new, in that newspaper at that time. They said that Liverpool fans had urinated on the dead, that they'd stolen from the dead. It's so bizarre. It's so appalling. And yet, um, these people, people were lying in hospital beds, having to read those sort of headlines, and they were clearly lies. You know, we hadn't even buried our dead, and they, they came up with some obscene, and that was the classic smear campaign. And whoever decided at, at the top level to, to cover this thing and, and exonerate the police was obviously instrumental uh, in getting that headline out. And although it was detracted, it done, it done what, it, what it was meant to do, which was cast a smear and throw mud and mud sticks. You know, immediately the focus shifts from where responsibility really lies on this occasion onto those people who, well, let's talk, I mean, they were at Heysel, weren't they? They were fighting on the terraces. That led to the death of 39 people in there. You know what they're like. You know what football fans are like. And these are football fans with knobs on. These are Liverpool football fans. Yeah, they're always fighting and misbe... You know, that whole operation grinds into action. And so they're immediately characterised as the worst kinds of people you can imagine. I actually read that headline on the way back down to Hillsborough because part of the drop-in centres that were going on there, the psychologists, and the, they invited everyone who wanted to go back onto coaches to go back down to, to Hillsborough. I was encouraged to go down that day. So I got on the coach and it was on the way down to there that, that somebody had bought the newspaper and, and it was passed around the coach. Um, so then, you know, when we got to Leppens Lane, we were all very, very angry, very angry at being, you know, at being blamed for it, really, and, and the, the pickpocketing and the particular stories that came out. So when I got back down there, we were all, not only were we confused, kind of lost souls, but we were very angry as well, and I felt like everyone hated us as well, so, you know, that, that made it even worse. We were on our knees, you know, holding our arms out for help. And then and it's just like someone coming along spitting on you and kicking you, you know, in your hour of need like that. And that's one thing that will never, ever be forgiven, not in this city, that will go on and on. If we haven't got the, the, the back of the big newspapers to come back and, and it's hit them back like that, you know, the only thing we could hit them by is not, is, is not buying the sun. And that's what we've done. The strength of feeling doesn't diminish. Um, we don't believe the, the sun will ever get a foothold on Merseyside ever again. It's made lots of attempts, uh, as you well know. Um, it won't succeed. coverage was Kelvin McKenzie's choice, a former editor of The Sun from 1981 to 1994, with many controversial headlines during his career, and a person that dominated the newspaper in that era. Although a lot of employees and journalists strongly disagreed with the words chosen, as well as with the content of the story, none raised their voice against the Little Hitler, as McKenzie was known among his colleagues. In their history of The Sun, Peter Chippendale and Chris Horry wrote, as Mackenzie's layout was seen by more and more people, a collective shunder ran through the office, but Mackenzie's dominance was so total there was nobody left in the organization who would rhyme him except murder. Everyone in the office seemed paralyzed. 
looking like rabbits in the headlights, as one hack described them. The error staring them in the face was too glaring. It obviously wasn't a silly mistake, nor was it a simple oversight. Nobody really had any comment on it. They just took one look and went away, shaking their heads in wonder at the enormity of it. It was a classic smear. Since then, the sun is known in Liverpool as the scum, and it is still boycotted in Merseyside by readers and news agents. The newspaper lost more than three quarters of its estimated 55,000 daily sales and still sells poorly more than 20 years later, approximately 12,000 copies. It is unavailable in many parts of the city, as many news agents refuse to stock it. The Hillsborough Justice Campaign also organised a less successful national boycott, but nevertheless did have an impact on the paper's sales. The Sun has issued an apology to the people of Liverpool 15 years after its coverage of the Hillsborough disaster. In a full-page letter, the Sun admitted its front-page story had been the most terrible mistake in the history of a newspaper. But the people of Merseyside did not forgive the tabloid. The issue was also addressed on the documentary Alexei Sales Liverpool on BBC Two when it covered the subject of Hillsborough. The segment saw comedian Alexei Sale with a news agent attempting to give away copies of The Sun, but every customer declined. A free copy of The Sun. You got your paper? Yeah, don't want the Sun. The sun. Today? Are you in red or the blue? I'm neutral. You're neutral? Yeah. Even the bit of blue won't buy it. That's good, yeah. Well, it's still, it's still a city, Solidarity, isn't it? Solidarity, yeah. Yeah. Trying to give these away, you know, if you're interested in them. No, the sun, free. No, Bye. Yeah. We're giving away three copies of the sun as well. Would you like one? No, you're not right. Yeah. We're trying to give away three copies of the sun. Do you want one? <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> no, thank you. We're trying to give away three copies of the sun. Would you like one? No. You wouldn't like a sun? No. Can't kind of force a sun on you? No. Can we take a sun for free? No. Completely free? No. Free sun? Do you want a free paper? The sun? Oh, yeah. No. The sun? No. Sorry, can I, can I, can I... You can burn it if you want, yeah. <laughs> Telephoto lens while their editor assures them the means justifies the end. Cause we only hunt celebrities, it's just a bit of fun. But scousers never buy the sun. While the parents of the missing girl cling desperately to hope. Copper takes improper payments in a thick brown envelope And no one in the newsroom asks where's this headline from And Scousers never buy the sun Mackenzie explained his reporting in 1993, talking to a House of Commons National Heritage Select Committee. He said, I regret Hillsborough. It was a fundamental mistake. The mistake was I believed what an MP said. It was a Tory MP. If he had not said it, and the Chief Superintendent David Dagenfield had not agreed with it, we wouldn't have gone with it. However, Mackenzie repudiated this apology in November 2006, saying that he only apologised because the newspaper's owner, Rupert Murdoch, ordered him to do so. He said he was not sorry then, and he's not sorry now for the paper's coverage. Mackenzie refused again to apologise when appearing on the BBC's Topical Question Time on 11th of January 2007. Just before we leave it, uh, do, do you stand by everything you said about Liverpool when you said you were forced to apologise by oh. Rupert Murdoch? Could I just briefly say, say I've, had a, I've had an email from someone whose husband died and someone who says he's just recovering and they're very angry with you. Oh, they are angry with me. They want to find somebody who, who, actually, who actually caused the, um, the disaster, right? I, that, that's the issue. I do, actually, funnily enough, there, were, there was one aspect I do believe that happened. I believe that the fans didn't have the tickets. But the, but the there were other the, aspects to it. The subheading, which, some fans picked the pockets of victims, well, that some came, fans urinated they, on they, the brave cops. Yes, they you still stand by those? Those allegations came from a Liverpool news agency and came from a Tory MP 
and an unknown, unnamed senior police officer. And you officer. stand by all of it? Uh, I stand by the ticketless aspect. I don't know about whether they urinated on them, and I don't know whether they stole their wallets. That story now has become so uh, caught up in a battle between um, the uh, Liverpool Football Club or some of the fans and me that actually, no matter what I said, nothing would resolve the issue. Finally, on the 8th of December 2011, during a clash with MP Chris Bryant on the BBC's Daily Politics show, Mackenzie eventually admitted that his coverage was wrong and apologised for the way he reported the events, although he insisted on his claim that the story emanated from a Liverpool agent, only to retract his statement the next day under the threat of a lawsuit from Liverpool news agents. Is tabloid journalism in the gutter? Oh, it's always been in the gutter. It's always been in the gutter. And um, it's quite a good place to be, actually. Uh, the idea, you're not high-minded, right? Ordinary working people are not high-minded. They basically want a bit of entertainment, they want a bit of sport, they want a bit of crime, they want a bit of, a bit of expenses fiddling. Nobody's suggesting democracy is at risk because a few MPs go on the fiddle on their expenses. No, nor should you say that journalism or free speech should be at risk because there was a cancer within one newspaper. What would you say to that? Well, that would be fine from Kelvin if it weren't for the fact that, first of all, he still refuses to apologise for what his newspaper did in, in regards to the Hillsborough disaster. He still refuses to apologise. I think you've owned up now, haven't you, to the fact that you hardly ever checked whether any stories were true because, frankly, that was rather irrelevant. Because all I want journalism to do is to return to its old-fashioned thing of bringing the, the, the truth to light but doing it within the law do, and do, not doing it on the basis I, I, of deception I'm, and not I'm, running I'm, headlines about Hillsborough oh that yes, were just complete and utter with, lies. This has got nothing to do with Hillsborough. Yeah, what this is about got, lying. No, this has got every... Well, how, how do you know what's happening at Hillsborough? How do you know? Well, how, how do, do you, you know? know? You, you printed no, on the front no, that page story, of the newspaper. That story came from a Liverpool news agency and Liverpool journalists. You, why don't you go, on your why don't you go and go newspaper. to every Kelvin. single newspaper carried Kelvin. that story, Kelvin. as you well Kelvin. know, Brian. You, I'm you, not listening to you that. Published carry on. Let you him published carry a newspaper you, that said that people had been... No, you've done the written by Liverpool journalists. You've done the Hillsborough Sorry. point. The viewers will make up their own minds. Right. I've got a broader question. <laughs> do you regret, do you have any regrets or remorse about some of the things you did as a tabloid editor? Um, probably. Yes, I do. Would that but, include Hillsborough? Uh, if I could revisit Hillsborough, certainly I'd do it in a different way. I'd do it in the way that the other newspapers did it, which was they basically ran the story and said, big fury over. And I wish I'd done that. Yeah. What led to Mackenzie's changing his stance according to the Hillsborough Family Support Group was the success of the e-petition about the full disclosure of the Cabinet's documents relating to the disaster and the debate it triggered in the House of Commons. During that debate, Liverpool MP Steve Rotherham fiercely criticised the son and the former editor. The loss of 96 innocent lives was bad enough, Mr Deputy Speaker but the tragic nature of their deaths was exacerbated by what happened next. Instead of those at fault taking responsibility for their actions, a coordinated campaign began to shift the blame and look for scapegoats. To this day, nobody has been held to account for Hillsborough. Is it any wonder that some people have doubtful and distorted views as to the ex exact cause of the disaster when misinformation began almost immediately after the players were led off the pitch at 3.06. The BBC and ITV News that very afternoon misreported what had occurred and it's important to understand the effect this had as it formed the immediate public perception of Hillsborough. Just a few days later, before people had even had time to arrange funerals for their loved ones, the Sun newspaper infamously printed the banner headline, The Truth on the Personal Instruction of its editor, Kelvin McKenzie. It claimed that drunken fans had forced the gates open because they did not have match tickets, that they had stolen from the corpses lying around the pitch, assaulted police officers in the emergency services, robbed cameras and other equipment from press photographers, and urinated on police officers helping the victims. This was one of the cruelest blows 
And it beggars belief that certain sections of the media still give airtime to this most despicable man to vent his bile and mendacity. This is a man who preaches about free speech, but who dehumanised the deaths of 96 people for a cheap headline. What an absolute hypocrite. Months later, the rag he edited admitted that the allegations it had made were totally false, but the damage had been done. To this day, the people of Merseyside do not buy that paper. The procedure was welcomed by all the people that have been campaigning for over 20 years to clear the name of their beloved ones that lost their lives that day, and gave them the courage to campaign for another e-petition, to force the Sun to reveal its sources for the infamous story. As Margaret Aspinall of the Hillsborough Family Support Group put it right after the debate in the House of Commons was over. And the word spoken about News International, Kevin uh, McKenzie, what, what were your thoughts uh, about that? Absolutely delighted when that was said about it. We've been saying this about Kelvin McKenzie for 20 odd yeah. years. We, as Jenny said earlier on, she doesn't want an apology now. Give us what I've asked for when Andy Burnham mentioned it. Give us, if you're any remorse in you whatsoever, give us the informant who spread that news. That will be some sort of an apology. And I think that is so important because when them lies were found to drown about the 96 and all our fans and survivors, that gave us the injustice where we are. That's why we're still talking to you today. And are you confident he will do that? Uh, well, shame on him if he doesn't. I mean, everybody's been asking for it now. Shame on him if he doesn't. That story that our children were drunken yobs came as we were grieving for their loss and we still had to defend their good names. But it set people's minds which you can still see even now that the disaster was caused by the fans, not by the police losing control. That set the injustice. The real truth never came out of the inquest and nobody in authority has ever been held to account. If we are now to discover the real truth, let the sun tell us who gave them those lies which caused so much damage.